Luke 17, verse number 11. The title of the message this morning is, Where, is the, where Are the Nine? Where Are the Nine? And as I draw your attention to verse number 11 of chapter number 17 in the book of Luke, we're going to read down to verse number 19. The Bible says, And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and, and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Let's pray. Father, please use this time that we've set aside to hear from you. May we listen to you with spiritual ears. Lord, I believe that there are varying different people in this crowd. But all of us should be this one. So, Father, I pray that we will focus on your word, that we will let you speak to our heart and change what needs to be changed. In your name, amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he's sojourning through this land, and the Bible says that he was going between Samaria and Galilee. Now, as you are well aware, those of you that are Bible students, you'll understand that Samaria was not a place where the Jews would, would frequent. It was a place of, uh, of complete, they would avoid it, they'd go all around it, they would do nothing with the people of Samaria. And so for Jesus to be sojourning through this land, it was culturally taboo. He didn't, he didn't uh, have a, he, Jesus made a ministry to reach multitudes of people. But we here see in the scripture, we see a group of lepers, a group of men who had a host of host of issues in their life. Now the ho and with a, with a host of issues, we have a host of lessons we can learn from them. And tonight, I want, or this morning, I want to focus on just a few of those lessons that we can learn from these ten lepers. I believe if believers applied these truths that we learned today, it would transform your life. See, number one, I want you to focus on the recipients of the miracle. This group of lepers, these men knew what it was like to be cast out. These men knew what it was like to be uh, rejected by society. They were acquainted with loneliness and suffering. That's what these men were acquainted with because of their leprosy. Leprosy, if you don't know, is a long-term infection of the nervous system. and affects the body's ability to feel pain or any sensation for that matter. And as a result of this, people would injure their bodies, and as a result of not feeling that pain, that pain would go unaddressed. See, pain's a good thing, Pastor Brandenburg. Pain's a good thing. It lets your body know there's something wrong. You need to pay attention to it. So be thankful for pain. People say to me, I say, how are you doing? They say, well, I'm in pain. I say, well, pain's a good thing. It lets you know you're still alive. Amen? But... These men, they would not feel this pain. Henceforth, there would be infections and decaying and dying away, and they would lose uh, extremities of the body. It was frequent to see a leper without ears, without nose, without toes, without a hand. It wasn't because their hands would fall off. It was because this infection would set in their body, and it would destroy their body. And we're going to see here in a little bit, leprosy is a spiritual sickness that people deal with as well. A, a sensation of not feeling the, the consequences of sin. Because of this condition, because it was incredibly infectious, they were 
cast out of society. They were secluded and they would live in towns of lepers. There would be colonies set up for people to just be able to sit there and die. That's what a leper's future was. This is why it was a, a very awful thing for somebody to be diagnosed with leprosy. These people would be separated from their family for an indefinite period of time. It was not just a regular occurrence that people would miraculously get better. This was a, two, a, a terminal sickness. Needless to say, their life was full of misery and woe. Leprosy is a picture of sin in the Bible. And all throughout that uh, time period, the response and the command of those people that had leprosy was to, if anybody were to come by in their presence, they were to immediately, they were required by law to shout, unclean, unclean. And they would shout unclean until those people would walk away. You'll see that in Leviticus chapter 13. The Bible talks about that command. Now, these condition of these men were pretty bleak. They were going to die. They were just waiting to die as a group. They were they were, their hope was decimated. It was depleted. There was nothing left within them to hope for. I can imagine fathers are there, hadn't seen their children in years because of the leprosy that was infecting their life. Imagine how humiliating it was. They would wrap themselves in rags. They would wrap themselves in rags and they would try to cover sores and wounds and try to do the best of their ability to take care of themselves. But imagine how humiliated they must feel as people would walk by and, and see all of the, the, uh, the unpleasantness before them as they shout unclean. They were trying to protect people from themselves. Physically speaking, they were a ticking time bomb. Waiting to, waiting to expire. Emotionally speaking, they were depressed. They faced, no, they faced no hope, no encouragement, no help at all. So do you have a proper understanding of what these men are going through right now? I want you to see that these guys had nothing to live for. Nothing to look forward to. But I want you to see, number two, the recognition of the master. Would you look at verse number 13? The Bible says, And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. See, in the, in, the, in the glimmer of hopelessness, in the sight of, of helplessness, Jesus comes by. He comes by in their, in their, in their place of, of seclusion, comes by in their place of loneliness. He comes by when they need him. They call out to Jesus. They said, Master, have mercy on us. They didn't shout unclean. We don't see in the Bible where they shout unclean because they saw the person who can make them clean. They could see the individual who was able to reach their needs, to take care of their needs. And they called out and said, Master, have mercy on us. These, destin these destitute men had one chance at life, one opportunity, one moment they could have restitution. Do you remember when you called out to the master? Brother, brother, uh, brother Bob, am I on here? Do you remember when you called out to the master? You remember when you realized that you were helpless and hopeless without Jesus Christ in your life? Do you remember that time where you felt the sickness of sin eroding away at you? I tell you, I see people in my line of work, I see what sin does to people. I see the, the, the trauma that is induced upon people. And it breaks my heart. I see those, those individuals who walk around in a drunken stupor walking down alleyways, walking at, and people who, are, uh, and not everyone who is at a corner is a result of their sin. Sometimes people fall in hard times. But the majority of people I see, it's because of drugs, alcohol, and riotous living that they're there. And it breaks my heart to see these people, to see them in the situation that they're in, because I know there's a master who can help them. 
I know there's a person they can turn to. He's the only person he can turn to for help. That fellow who I talked to today, his name is Rick. Pray for Rick. He sat out here and laid on that carpet that you walked in this morning. Laid there. And as I walked up, immediately, my flesh said, he needs to get out of here. Get him out of here. And, and I could walk up, and I wasn't even under the overhang, and I can smell the stench. It was just, it was appalling. And, but you know what? I began to say within myself, how despicable of a Christian would you be that that man is sleeping at the church, at the door of a church, and you're going to turn him away and, and uh, 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 verbally chastise him for what he's doing? See, those are the unpleasant ones. These lepers, the unpleasant ones. You see, it's, it's all nice to go up to somebody who's got a three-piece suit on and a tie and you want to invite him to church. But how about that person you drive by every morning to work who's standing on the side of the road begging for money, begging for food, and we drive by and we have the one thing that they need and we don't give it to them. Shame on us. I'll say it again. I said, shame on us. I'll be like Brother Peter. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have to give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. You know what I'm trying to say is, you have what they need. You have what your co-worker needs. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you just take some time to tell somebody about Jesus, I assure you, it change your life. If you just take a minute of your time, he said, well, I'm not comfortable in telling people about Jesus. Well, aren't you glad somebody is comfortable to tell you? Come on, help, don't get quiet on me, church. Aren't you glad somebody told you? I'm telling you, people need the gospel. People need the gospel. We can sing songs about heaven. We can sing songs about the faith in Jesus Christ. But what good is it going to do to all those people who will never darken a door of a church? Where are the nine? These men knew they had a problem. I didn't have to convince Rick that he had a problem. I didn't have to convince Rick that he needed something. I told him, I said, Rick, you need Jesus. And if you just call out to Jesus, Rick, he'll save you. I can't give you a home here on earth. I can't give you all the things that you need here. I said, I can certainly try. I can give you some water. I can give you a little food. But that's all I can do. But I can do something more for you. I can give you a home in heaven through Jesus Christ. I can give you the ticket to heaven. His name is Jesus Christ. And I can show you how you can get there today if you just trust him. I don't believe it's coincidental that that man stumbled on this property. You see, church, there are thousands and thousands of people like that. And you know what? They might even be like that. The problem is, is there are some people who aren't in those positions, and they think they do okay. What good is a leper if he doesn't think he's unclean? He could sit there and say, oh, you know, I'm all right. While his nose is falling off, while his ears falling off, I'm okay. I don't need Jesus. I don't need healing. I can take care of myself. There was nothing those men could do for themselves. Not a single thing. But do you remember the day you were made clean? That's what these men had wanted. They wanted to be clean again. They wanted that restoration. And I'm so glad we see here in the Bible that the Bible says, and when he saw them, this is Jesus in verse 14, he said to them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. Jesus heard their cry. But he heard, he heard their cry and he addressed their need. No matter what desperate situation you found yourself in life. And I can't begin to say that I know everybody's circumstances because I don't. But I'm going to tell you, your situation is going to be drastically changed when you get to the feet of Jesus. When you get to Jesus in your life, he is the one that can help you. You can come to me and, woe and, and, and echo your woes to me. But look at me, listen, I can't help you. I can't help you. I'm a, I'm a person, I'm a human being just like you. 
I have flaws. I have failures. I have problems in life. I can't help you, but I can point you to one who can. I can point you to one whose name is Jesus, and he can help you. Go to Jesus. You have an addiction here today? Go to Jesus. Don't go to AA. Listen, I'm not trying to be a doctor for you, but I listen. I've sent, I've seen people go to AA and come out the same. I've seen keep people go to other self-help programs and they come out the same. But something, somehow, when they get to the feet of Jesus, something changes. No, I don't care what self-help program you go to. It's still run by a man. Any self-help program, it's still the, the, the philosophy, the AA's Bible, is still was made by a man. But I'm here to tell you today, this book was not made by man. It was it's breathed by God himself, given to mankind to address mankind's needs. And it's for you, and it's for me. These ten lepers went to Jesus, and I'm happy to say they weren't disappointed. They weren't disappointed. Jesus is mighty to save. And when he saw them, that's what I want you to see right here. And when he saw them, we have a God who sees you. I don't care what situation you're in in life. Look at me. Listen. I don't care what situation you're in in life. You have a God who sees you where you are. You have a God who notices you. He's not ambivalent. He's not ignorant. He's not some old, decrepit man sitting in a rocking chair up in heaven. He's not that old man upstairs. That's not what my heavenly father is. He sees you, and he notices you, and he wants you. That's my heavenly father. Thank God for that. And when he saw them. Well, what I want you to see this morning is this. I want you to see the obedience of the men. I want you to see... Jesus told them, he says, go show yourself to the priest. You see that? Verse number 14, he says, go show yourself unto the priest. You know what Jesus was doing? He was following his own law that he said to the, to the Israelites. He said, uh, the, the law, Levitical law was, and those of you in my Sunday school class will be seeing these things, the Levitical law was, when you, if you ever were restored of leprosy by some miraculous occasion, you were to immediately go show yourself to the priest. Now, this is what Jesus does. He says, go show yourself to the priest. Now, I want you to understand. The Bible does not say that Jesus healed him right there. Does it? Look at the Bible. Look, help me out. Correct me if I'm wrong. He said, go show yourself unto the priest. Did he say, thou art healed? Did he say, you're cleansed? Now, I'm going to tell you what happens sometimes. Sometimes when we give the gospel to people and we tell them, I tell, here's what I say. I say, here's a gospel track that can tell you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Them taking that gospel track doesn't make them saved. Them coming to church doesn't make them saved. It's by an act of obedience followed with submission. A person can't get saved without submitting to God. You can't. You have to agree with God. You have to say within yourself, I am wrong and you are right. God, what you say about me is correct. I am in need. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Remember when I said that leprosy is a spiritual picture of sin. And everybody in this room has been touched by spiritual leprosy. We're all sinners in here. Amen? Amen. The Bible says, As it is written, there is none righteous no, not one. But that doesn't mean that you can keep living your lifestyle like you are. And like I am. That doesn't mean we can live our life however we want. Because one day you're going to give an account of yourself to God. One day you're going to stand before God as a child of God or as, a, as, a, as the Bible says, as, as the wicked, a wicked generation. One that has, has rejected Jesus Christ. And you're going to stand before God one day and you're going to show yourself to be either a child of God or a child of the devil. But the obedience of an individual is what determines if you get saved by obeying God. And the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, look up here, hey, look up here. 
If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what He wants. He wants to clean you. But you have to do what He says to do. You don't get to heaven by your way. I don't get to heaven by my way. There's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. However, how can we ever think a miracle will happen in our life unless we talk to the miracle worker? The Bible, Bible talks about Jesus and, and all the miraculous things he did, but people had to come to Jesus to get the miracles to work in, him, in their life. Christian, if we think we're going to stand there and wait for a miracle to happen in our life, you want to grow as a Christian? You want to see God work in your life? It's not going to happen by being disobedient. It's going to happen by being obedient. How can we think a miracle will happen in our life without practicing faith and obedience like these men? These men, listen, wake up, listen to me. These men, they were not guaranteed cleansing yet. The Bible says, later in that verse, it says, and as they went, they were cleansed. As they went. That's an act of faith. That's an act of submission. An act of obedience. They could have just stood there and, and, and said, well, you know, I still see these sores. I still see that I am lacking fingers. I'm not cleansed, so I'm not going anywhere. They could have said that, and they would have died that way. But they said, let's go. And that's what I'm asking you today. If you're sitting here and you're lost, why stand there with your, with your issue, with your sin issue? Why stand there? You hear the truth. You hear, you hear the opportunity of forgiveness. You hear it. Why stand there disobedient? Listen to the wooing of the Holy Spirit in your life as, as he says he's talking about you. I remember that day in my life. Say amen if you remember that day. Man, I remember that day in my life where the Holy Spirit said, there's, what he's saying is true, and you need to obey that. I, re, I remember it, and I, I remember calling out to God. I remember all those things. I remember the clear the voice of the Holy Spirit of God in my heart speaking to me. I remember it as sure as I remember this morning. I'm so glad I obeyed him, and I didn't, I didn't disobey him. I didn't reject him. I didn't rebel against him. You see, there are some people who... Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, the Holy Spirit of God put, pricks at their heart and, and says, you are lost, you are not saved. If you died right now, you'll split hell wide open. And they hear that and say, eh, I'm not too bad. I got a little bit of time. I said this morning, the Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You don't know when your day is done. These lepers, they didn't know when their final day was done. They had no clue. They had no idea. But all they knew is they needed some help. They needed Jesus. Number three, I want you to see the rejection by the majority. Look at verse 15. The Bible says, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith had made thee whole. After these men were healed, do you know what they did? They kept walking. Something that bothers me, and I don't know if it bothers you, but something about this generation today is when you do something nice for them, they don't say nothing in return. I can't tell you how many balloons I made yesterday. I'm telling you right now, I got a fraction of thank yous. In fact, some people, I heard some people were even um, a little upset about our lines. And when, listen, they're like, it's free. What do you want? You know, we're not paying for this. But listen, we, we live in an unthankful generation. We live in an unthankful generation. All these people that, you know, they have this idea that because I exist, I deserve. Gimme, 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 gimme. And they sit there, selfish, I mean, self-consumed people. Gimme. After these men were healed, they kept walking. 
walking to the priest. They were doing what they were told to do. But one man does something peculiar. He does something different. The Bible says that he turns around and he glorifies God. The Bible says that he's walking away, he becomes healed, he turns around, he glorifies God. The very next thing we see is that he's gotten closer with Jesus. Now he's at his feet. Jesus used a lowly Samaritan to prove a point once again. You see, the Samaritans God used many times to put to shame to his children. The Samaritan woman at the well. The Samaritan woman who, was, who came to Jesus and he says, uh, and she said, uh, the, even the dogs uh, lick up, or had the crumbs at the table. Jesus showed about the good Samaritan. You remember that story? Jesus is teaching his children, you're missing something. A Samaritan. You see, the Jews looked down at the Samaritans. The reason why is because they were a mixed race of, uh, of the Israelites with the Assyrians. The Assyrians were their enemies. And the Assyrians did heinous, awful things to the people of Israel. This is why they detested those people. But Jesus loved those people. He cared for them. He came for the people of Israel, but his blessings spilled over on others. You know, we can learn a lot from the Samaritan. You know why? Because he was thankful. I'm going I'm to say this. If, if you are truly, genuinely thankful for what God's done in your life, nobody would have to beg you to do anything for anybody. I wouldn't have to, I wouldn't have to beg people to, to volunteer their time. I wouldn't have to beg people to get on a bus route. I wouldn't have to beg people to come soul winning. If you and I were truly thankful for the day that you and I were cleansed from our sin, there would not have to be one voice uttered by anybody. We did just see the need and be involved. But here's what happens. We, again, we look down upon uh, from our pious nose at this generation of young people, how unthankful they are. But here's, here's the issue. You and I are just as unthankful. I know this ain't popular preaching, but it's true. Amen me if it's true. Help me out now. Come on. We live in an unthankful generation, but they were taught by unthankful people. They were taught by unthankful people. And listen, I don't begin to say that I know the situation of every person in here, but I will say this. If we were truly thankful for something and for somebody did, we'd bend over backwards to repay the favor. Man, if somebody, if somebody did something for me, man, I would be just through the moon and I'd say, what can I do for you? I want to do something for you. That's what kindness does. It evokes kindness from others. This man, he recognized he had a need. Jesus fulfilled that need and he comes back with a heart of thankfulness. Think, take a moment and think about what God's done for you in your heart and your life. Take a, just go ahead, stop for just a second and think of how God has been so incredibly good to you. What he's done for you. All what he's, all what he's taken care of. All that he's, even if, even if, even if he just forgave you of your sins so you didn't die and go to hell. That's far better than you and I ever deserve. But he did more than that. Not only did he give you heaven, but he gave you a position in his family. Amen. Not only that, but he's given you blessings. Amen. He's blessing your life. Why is it that we have such a hard time yielding to God in our life and obeying him? Why is it so difficult? Because of unthankfulness. Because of the unthankfulness and unappreciation, this is what motivates the selfish Christian. Spur Spurgeon wrote about this man. He said, the sad thing about is that this, this nine of them, though they were healed, went on their way to the priest in the coolest possible manner. We never hear of their return. They drop out of the story altogether. They have attained a blessing. They go their way, and that is the end of them. If you search the world around, among all choice spices, you shall scarcely meet with a frankincense of gratitude. It ought to be as common as the dew drops that hang upon the hedges in the morning. But alas, 
The world is dry of thank thankfulness to God. Gratitude to Christ was scarcely enough in his own day. See, quite often, doesn't, quite often the majority doesn't do what the majority, excuse me, quite often is the case, the majority is never the right majority. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, is that, you know, just because a thousand people say something's right doesn't mean that the one person's voice is wrong. We live in it today, in this, in this generation where we'll be voting pretty soon on the morality of our nation. When it comes to abortion, when it comes to a whole host of matters. And your involvement is going to determine the continuance of the immorality or the pivot of morality. I don't care what you might think of what political affiliation I have, because it really don't matter, honestly, a hill of beans. But what matters is, it doesn't matter what party you are in, it doesn't matter who your poster boy or girl is, it ought to be that a Christian votes based on the morality that God commands of us. We ought to be living a life of morality and cleanness and thankfulness for what God has done. This country was founded on the morals of the Bible. It started, it was founded upon the Bible, and it's changed. Jesus told this man, he said, Thy faith had made thee whole. Now, I want you to see real quick here. We'll do a small little mini Bible study. I want you to look back here in verse number 14. Because there's a difference here in the terminology that Jesus used. If you've got your Bible, say amen. You know, I hope you come to church with your Bible. Amen. Verse number 14. And it came to pass that as they went, they were, what's that word? Verse 14. The last word of verse 14. What is it? Cleansed. As they went, they were, say it, cleansed. Now, get back down to verse number 19. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. There's a big difference between those two words. You see, cleansed is a physical healing. Can I tell you that probably not every person that Jesus healed got saved? We see that here. There's a big difference between being cleansed and being whole. Can God hear the prayers of a lost person when it comes to being, being cleansed of their physical infirmities? Yeah, he can. If he chooses to, does that make them forgiven of their sins? No. What changes that factor is faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. Not just faith in, in having him be able to. You see, I have people, I, I visit in the hospital, I'll go through the hospitals and I'll talk to them, I'll pray with them, random strangers, I'll pray with them, and I'll tell them, if you have faith in God, I assure you, God can heal of you, of your, of your infirmity, of your problem. I, I tell them that. God can hear your prayer. I don't, I don't rob them of that hope and say, you know, God don't listen to you because you're not saved. God can if he chooses to. But the greatest need that they need healing from is from their sin sickness. And I always follow up and say, before I leave, I want you to know you're going to heaven. And I give them the gospel. Jesus told this man, thy faith had made thee whole. Were it not for the faith of that man, he would have died a leper. But more than that, he would have died and went to hell. But because of his faith, it changed his entire destiny. Nine out of the ten were Content just had the blessings of God. Only one was content when he could thank the one who made the difference. So, so many of us in here today, we're ha we have had tasted the blessings of God in our life. But we just keep walking. We're unappreciated. We've, we've turned our back to God and kept moving along in our life. Thanks, thanks for everything. I'm going on to continue what I want to do. You see, God wants you to turn around and get close to him in return. God wants you to get to at his feet. Out of a heart of thankfulness and a heart of love, God says, come back home. Come back to me. Get closer to me. Submit to me. Unfortunately, this is the sad picture of many churches today in our country who receive blessings and don't find them worthy enough to offer something in return. 
that if we're truly for thankful for what the Master has done in our life, nothing should be too great for God. Nothing would, should be too much for Him. You think about all the opportunities we have to thank God for what He's done. Man, just one of those this morning is running a bus route. Again, pray for the bus route. We need bus workers. And listen, all those people that are on our property yesterday, how are they going to get to church? Mom and dad probably won't take them. How are those kids going to get to church? Listen, we've got to have a passion. We've got to have a care and concern. And not just the pastors. People have to reach people. People have to care about other people. Man, my heart breaks every time that I drive through. I mean, just these neighborhoods are popping up like weeds everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And we're passing them by every single Saturday, every single Sunday. Would it be to God that we have multiple bus routes where it's, where it's run by Trident Baptist Church and the good people of our church that care about other people? Man, it's a sad day when we just keep coming to church by ourselves. Nobody here with us. Nobody here because we invited them. Listen, care about somebody. Jesus cared about these men. He cared about them. He, re, he, he sought after them. Jesus didn't stumble by there. He went to go meet them. We've got to care about people. We've got to reach people. Why? Uh, and say, I'll say this in closing. Why did only one cleansed leper return to thank Jesus? The following nine are suggested reasons of why the nine didn't return. One, waited to see if the cure was real. One waited to see if it would last. One said he would see Jesus at a later time. One decided that he had never had leprosy to begin with. One said he would have gotten well anyway. One could have said, oh, I'll give glory to the priest and he can re turn send it to God. One said, oh, well, Jesus didn't really do anything. One said, any rabbi could have done that. One said, I was already much improved. What am I trying to say here? They were unthankful. They didn't recognize the depravity of their need. They didn't recognize the depra depravity of their condition. Jesus has made all the difference in my life. I was unclean at one time. So were you. I was unclean. I was in need of Jesus and his touch in my life. But I didn't get cleansed by myself. I didn't get, I didn't get restored by myself. It took the shed blood of Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's, here's what I want you to, if you didn't listen to anything I said, listen to this. If you want change in your life, and if you want purpose in your life, you need Jesus. If you want things to be different in your life, if you're sad of how dis despicable your life is, one, you need to get saved, and two, you need to stop living for yourself and stop living for your, your pursuits of your own life and start living for Jesus. Jesus is the, is the fulfillment of purpose when he's in your life. I have, the biggest time I have, when I talk to people who are struggling with depression and who think, I just, I have no reason of living. I live a depressed life, Pastor. You know how to tell them? I tell them, the equally most selfish person is the equally most miserable person. When you live a life of selfishness and away from God, you're going to be miserable. You're going to be miserable. Start living for God. Find real purpose in your life. And understand that when you live for Jesus and when you get back to the feet of Jesus and when you begin to voice your uh, appreciation and with a loud voice cry out to God and say glory to God, I think things will change in your life and mine. Man, I hope you come to church just shouting from the housetop. Man, glory to God for what he's done. I could, I'll tell you right now, I, if I weren't saved, I'd probably be either dead, prison, or in an insane asylum. 
But you know what? Because of Jesus Christ, I'm here today. I'm not a product. I'm not a self-made product. Because you know what? If I had to just follow after myself, again, I'd be in one of those three places. Why don't you just get back to Jesus? I'm asking you, where are the nine? Maybe there are the, the minorities probably here. Where's the majority? Where's the, where's the large mass of people that have seen and tasted of God's goodness? Why are they? Why aren't they coming back? It's time to come back. It's time to get back at the feet of Jesus. Would you bow your head and would you close your eyes, please, this morning?